stop it here. Yeah, we don't need all this recorded. And Aline and everybody, uh, Annette, Diane, Kat, I think I said most, uh, most. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Um, okay, so I asked, I asked Craig if I might, uh, you know, do some talks on the archetypes because, you know, what I told him is I said, look, you know, when I try to think of all the archetypes out there, it's, you know, I find it difficult to really, you know, picture them and personify them. And, you know, Craig said, yeah, that might, that might be a, a good thing to do. So what I found was um, a, a book by Sally Nichols and uh, it was called Tarot and the Archetypal Journey. So basically what she got does, and she's a Jungian, uh, you know, analyst. She did her, her, her work at the, at the Young Institute and stuff, you know, she's got really good credentials. The book reads really well. It has a lot of depth. And so she basically goes through and in like 420 pages, you know, gives the, you know, the symbolism and, you know, behind each of the tarot cards, which I thought was, was pretty interesting. So uh, what I thought I'd do is I'd spend like, you know, five minutes at the, at the start of each session and I'll cover one tarot card and and i and i also i think this almost relates back to uh angelique's presentation last week where she was talking about the divine in uh projections and you know what i what i related it to was uh you know hillman he wrote this book called um, you know, the myth of analysis where, you know, he actually kind of dissed analysis. And, and what he said was that, you know, that uh, we should steer clear of analysis because it may disturb the myth in, in the madness. And that, you know, maybe the madness is, you know, this is part of the mythic journey that we need to take. So, you know, if our psychological lives are following um, a mythical pattern, then you know, we're better following the archetype that has its own pathological theme uh, because, you know, that's the one that has the archetypal perspective. And, you know, and, and projections are almost always associated with some sort of archetype. So in that sense, you know, I think, you know, if there are myths that we have to lead in order to, to you know, learn the things we need to learn, I guess there's, you know, there's divine both in the positive and the negative. Um, so an archetypal psychopathology, that was what Hillman specialized in. And, you know, so he said the myth had to be followed that, you know, that Christ had to be sacrificed, uh, Dionysus must be childish and, you know, attract, uh, titanic enemies, uh, Persephone had to be raped, you know, all these things were actually necessary. Um, so in this, in this book that I'm talking about, Tarot and the Archetypal Journey, what Sally Nichols says is the most significant, you know, contribution to the understanding of consciousness is that it can only be renewed and um, enlarged as life demands it by maintaining the non-rational lines of communication with the collective unconscious. Um, and to to understand, you know, these comments that the unconscious is making by its projections in the, in the form of archetypes, um, you know, which are acknowledging, you know, to, so that we can acknowledge its unmet needs. It's useful to know, you know, which myth we're caught in, which archetype, you know, we're manifesting. And, and if we do this, um, we can bring it into greater consciousness and, you know, we can be more of a witness to our lives rather than, you know, always being caught up in the, in the projections that we do. So the first archetype is the fool. And the fool, uh, he connects two worlds. He connects the everyday world um, and the nonverbal instinctual world. And the fool moves freely between these worlds. So he's a wanderer, he's energetic, he's ubiquitous and immortal. Uh, he often upsets the established order with his pranks and, you know, unfathomable actions. 
And the fool is in such close contact with his instinctual side that he does not need to look where he's going in the literal sense. His animal nature guides his steps. And I, you know, I love this one, you know, he's like right ready, to, he's ready to go off the cliff, you know, but no need to look. And, you know, and stories like the, the Shakespearean fool could act as like the, the king's alter ego. And, and so, and King Lear, uh, the fool seems to symbolize that kingly wisdom that Lear himself doesn't actually attain until the very end of the play. And according to James Kirsch, Lear's fool personifies the central core of the psyche, the guiding force, which Jung has called the self. And, and if you think of it, you know, if, this is, if the fool's going back and forth between the instinctual and the conscious side, you know, it does seem like the self. And in fairy tales, uh, you know, just like the, the foolhardy third brother who rushes in where angels fears to tread, and by doing so, you know, wins the uh, hand of the princess and her kingdom, the full spontaneous approach to life combines wisdom, madness, and, and folly. And so when he mixes these ingredients in the right uh, proportions, you know, we get the desired outcome. But when the mixture doesn't work, then everything can end up a mess. And at these times, the fool can look really foolish, but being a fool, you know, he has the good sense to not to mind, you know, that's actually okay. And he's, he's often pictured like bottom wearing the ass's ears because he knows that to admit ignorance is the highest knowledge, you know, the necessary uh, condition of all learning. So our inner fool um, urges us on to life where the thinking mind might be overcautious. And what seems like a precipice from afar may prove to be only a small goalie when approached with the fool's gusto. So his energy sweeps everything before him, carrying others along like leaves in a, in a fresh wind. And without the fool's energy, all of us would be, you know, mere pasteboard in, in, the, in the fairy tales that, that we live. So that's my little five minute presentation and, you know, we can do like one of these a week. But what I like, and Hillman was really big on this too, is that, you know, if we can kind of become aware of our projections and then personify them, you know, then that, that makes it easier to do the, to do the dialogue, to, you know, to do the act of imagination with them. So I thought, yeah, this would be, this would be a good thing to do. So there you have it. Take it away, Craig. That's great. You know, a black elk was a hekoya, a sacred clown, you know, and actually in, in a fairy tale, you know, the two favored sons of the king can't uh, ever uh, lift the curse, cure the enchantment, because uh, they're representatives of the conscious attitude, where the fool never is. It always represents those depths. Uh, irrational depths where, uh, you know, uh, uh, one and one don't equal two anymore. I mean, it's just this uh, marvelous uh, world of, of the metamorphoses uh, of uh, uh, transformations, the, the non-literal world. So that's wonderful, Gary. It's just great. I see uh, Kevin's here too. Great. That's great to see you, Kevin. And uh, I haven't seen uh, you for a while. Well, we're gonna do uh, the fairy tale today about um, the uh, um, Vasilisa, you know, the beautiful. And uh, it's the last fairy tale. And uh, it is uh, just a, uh, I, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a very, you know, when I read it, I kind of feel like I'm treading on sacred ground or something, you know, it's a, it, it just has this feeling that you're uh, behind the curtain or something. You know, I just have this uh, feeling of, uh, of eeriness, you know, and it's um, uh, the, the, pro the problem of the negative mother complex on a deeper level. Uh, it's, it's the problem of related lading to a feminine aspect of the Godhead 
in its numinous and sometimes dangerous side. Now that uh, the whole idea is, um, is the mother symbol dies, the mother dies. She gives uh, Vasilisa a doll and uh, a blessing. And then uh, suddenly, uh, because that was the opening, we're, we'll find out what, uh, she goes into at length what it means to have the mother symbol die. I mean, in other words, the, um, this, this, uh, this does have to do with projections, you know, that um, we need to come out of the participation mystique if we're a daughter with the mother, but we're not supposed to throw out, uh, as, as Angelique said, uh, the, the contents of the projection. But until we do that, we're not able to, uh, uh, you, you know, to, to become someone who is not one of the herd, you know, uh, someone who is, uh, who, who, who is, who has left the flock. You know, there's this wonderful uh, image that uh, uh, Young has from uh, the vision seminars uh, of uh, there's a, um, uh, all these, uh, th this woman is standing by a, a river that's flowing with bodies, okay? And uh, it's just teeming with bodies who just flow on and every, ever flowing stream. And then there are people on the bank that call to the people in the uh, stream. And every once in a while, there'll be one who sees and they reach out and then they pull that person out and then they turn and point to a star. You know, so uh, this, this is somewhat uh, like, um, the uh, what what needs to happen for us to come out of this uh, flowing stream of bodies? How do we come out and see that there's a there's a world, uh, uh, another world, and it's oriented by a fixed point far away? And there's so much in here that's feminine. I mean, uh, Aline mentioned the poppy seeds earlier. <laughs> you know. We'll go through those, but the uh, uh, there, there's two seeds that she has to separate, and see, see, this is the feminine uh, way of, uh, of uh, orientation, where where the where the masculine logos wants to get a bird's eye view of everything, you know, go far above the uh, feminine, and and she's going to uh, tell us why you know, needs to sort through things in detail for her clarity. You know, the man, the masculine uh, consciousness gets its clarity from going far above and looking down where the feminine consciousness gets its clarity by sorting through the things that are near at hand, you know, and uh, that's how she gains clarity because otherwise everything's muddled, you know, and, and that is... Uh, the, the muddling aspect is the shadow aspect, aspect of, un, of, of this lack of clarity. But anyway, uh, let's just go through the uh, uh, fairy tales uh, sort of uh, quickly. Uh, it's, um, you know, the merchant and, and a wife have a beautiful daughter and uh, uh, her mother at eight years old becomes very ill. And on her deathbed, she gives Vasilis a doll saying, um, these are my last words and don't forget them. I am dying and I leave you my blessings and this doll. Keep it always with you, show it to no one. And whenever you are in any trouble, ask it for advice. Then she kissed uh, her for the last time and she dies. Okay, so that's all we get of the mother uh, in this fairy tale. Uh, now the, the merchant, mourns his wife for a, for a long time, but then decides to marry and choose a widow with two daughters. And this new wife was a cruel stepmother who gave her all the hard work to do. 
gave but Vasilisa, hoping the sun and the wind would spoil her beauty and make her look more like a peasant girl. But Vasilisa became more beautiful every day. And while the stepsisters got thinner and uglier all the time because of their envy of Vasilisa, uh, although they, even, even though they sat idle all day with their hands in their laps, the doll, however, comforted Vasilisa and did a lot of work for her. And though Vasilisa was much sought after by men, she was forbidden to marry uh, before her stepsisters, who no one ever looked at. Then the merchant had to leave the country. So that's the end of the father. <laughs> this is all, all takes place in the feminine realm without the mother, without the father. The stepmother uh, moves to a house at the edge of a great wood. And here is where, in a clearing, Baba Yaga lives. Now, Baba Yaga, Baba means grandmother. Yaga means, there's a lot of theories of what it means, but it seems to mean um, fright or sh horror or something. Grandma fright, you know. So uh, Baba Yaga permitted no one to approach her uh, house and anyone who did, she would devour. Now the stepmother's selection of the house was precisely for the purpose of Vasilisa uh, being devoured by Baba Yaga. She sent her uh, into Baba Yaga's forest every day, but she always returned uh, safely thanks to the doll. And one fall evening, the stepmother gave the girls work to do. One knitted, one embroidered, but Vasilisa had to spin and the stepmother put out the fire and the girls uh, and, and left a small light burning so the girls could see to work and went off to bed. The candle burnt down. The stepsister in, in, pretended to clean out the wick, wick, but deliberately puts out the candle. Um, uh, the daughters said they could see with their needles. They gave them enough light. But Vasilisa must go to Baba Yaga to fetch the fire and pushed her out of the room. So she went uh, to feed her doll and told her that she must go into the forest. And the doll told her not to be afraid, but to take along, take her along and nothing bad would happen. Uh, Vasilisa was terrified, put the doll in her pocket, crossed herself and went into the wood. Suddenly a man in white uh, rode by on a horse and day came. These are, these are really add a lot to the story. All through the night and the next, uh, uh, then further on, uh, a man in a red, on a, in red rode by on a red horse and the sun rose. And all through the night and the next day, Vasilisa walked through the wood and in the evening came to a hut surrounded by a hedge made of human bones. Uh, the bolt to the door was a human arm, and in place of the lock was a mouth with grinning teeth. Uh, frozen in horror, she stood rooted to the spot. Now, you know, this is uh, an image that comes up in uh, my uh, uh, in encounters with the Great Mother, is that she's related to bones, you know, because she's seen every uh, being who's ever came. So this is sort of a symbol of her ancientness, you know, that she's uh, surrounded by human uh, uh, bones, you know, these grisly relics, but they really just represent the flow of life. So uh, the um, frozen in horror, she stood rooted to the spot and another rider comes by, this one all in black on a black horse. She jumps off, he jumps off, opens the door and disappears as if swallowed up by the ground. And it was black as night. But soon all the eyes and the skulls that made the hedge uh, began to twinkle and it was light as day in the clearing. Vaseline, Lissa trembled, but didn't know where to go. So she stood still. The trees began to rustle. And then Baba Yaga appears sitting in a mortar and steering with a pestle. Now this is just unbelievable, this image. She's sitting in a mortar and, and steering with a pestle. And she, and she uh, wipes out the tracks and traces behind her with a broom. 
And when she reaches the door, she sniffs and cries out, it smells like Russians. And she asks um, who was there. I am grandmother. My stepsisters sent me to you to uh, fetch the fire. Good, said the Baba Yaga. I know you, she says. It's very interesting. Stay with me for a bit and then you shall have the fire. So they went in together and the Baba Yaga laid down and told Vasilisa to bring her everything that was in the oven to eat. And there was enough for 10, but the Baba Yaga ate everything up and left only a crust of bread and a little soup for Vasilisa. And then she said, tomorrow when I go out, I'm gonna sweep up the yard, sweep out the hut, cook the midday meal, do the washing, then go into the corn shed and sort out all the mildewed corn from the good seed. Everything must be done by the time I get home. Otherwise, I shall eat you. And so when Baba Yaga began snoring in the bed, Vasilisa gave the doll the crust of bread and the soup she had and told her all of the hard work she had to do. But the doll said she should eat the food herself and not be afraid. Yet say her prayers and go to bed. For the morning was, was cleverer than the, meat, than the evening. So in the morning, when Vasilisa woke up, the eyes and the skulls were just shutting. The white rider rode by on his white horse and the day came. And then Baba Yaga whistled and the pestle, mortar and broom appeared. And the red rider uh, rode by and the sun came up. It's just beautiful, I think, these images. When Baba Yaga had gone, Vasilisa was left quite alone and troubled as to uh, which work she should begin, but it was all done already. The doll was just removing the last uh, seeds of the mildewed corn. And Vasilisa called the doll her savior and saying it had saved her from, the great, uh, from great misfortune. And the doll told her that now she uh, had to cook the dinner and when the evening came, Vasilisa laid the table and waited. Uh, and when the Baba Yaga came, she asked if everything was done. Look for yourself, grandmother, said Vasilisa. The Baba Yaga looked at everything and was um, disappointed not to be able to find any fault. But she only said, yes, it's all right. And then called on her faithful servants uh, to grind her corn which were three pairs of hands. <laughs> Thereupon, the three pairs of hands appeared and began to sort out the grain. The Baba Yaga ate just as much as the evening before, told Vasilisa she should do the same work the next day, but in addition, she should sort the poppy seeds in the granary and clear the dirt away. And again, Vasilisa asked the doll, who told her to do the same as the evening before, and the next day, the doll did everything Vasilisa was supposed to do. And when the Baba Yaga came home, she looked everything over and then called to her faithful servants. And three pairs of hands appeared and removed the poppy seeds and pressed out the oil. And when, while the Baba Yaga was eating uh, her meal, Vasilisa stood silently by, beside her. What are you staring at without speaking a word? Are you dumb? asked the Baba Yaga. I would like to ask some questions, said Vasilisa. Ask, but remember that not all questions are wise and much knowledge makes one old. So Vasilisa said she would only like to ask about the writers. The Baba Yaga told her the first writer was her day, the red her sun, and the black her night. And then Vasilisa thought of the three pairs of hands, but didn't dare to ask about them and kept silent. Why don't you ask more, asked Baba Yaga. That's enough. You said yourself, grandmother, that too much knowledge made people old. And then the Baba Yaga, Yaga said she was wise only to ask about what she saw outside the hut, but that now she would like to ask her questions. She asked how Vasilisa managed all the work, and Vasilisa said her mother's blessing helped her. Is that so, said the Baba Yaga. Then get out of the, here. I don't want any blessings inside my house. So she pushed Vasilisa out of the room and out of the door and took a skull, a skull from the hedge uh, with the burning eyes in it, put it on a pole, 
and gave it to Vasilisa saying, here is your fire for your stepsisters. Take it home with you. So Vasilisa hurried away and by the evening of the next day arrived home and thought she would throw the skull away, but a voice came from it saying, saying uh, she should not do so, but should take it to her stepmother. And because Vasilisa saw no light in the house, she did just that. And for the first time ever, the stepmother and the stepsisters came to meet her in a friendly way and told her they had no fire since she left. They had not been able to light any fire and what they fetched from the neighbors was extinguished as soon as they got to their house. Perhaps your fire won't go out, said the stepmother. She took the skull into the living room, but the glowing eyes stared unceasingly into hers and her daughter's eyes right down to their souls. They tried to hide, but the eyes followed them everywhere. And by morning, they were burnt to ashes. So when day came, Vasilisa buried, buried the skull, shut up the house, went into town, and asked a lonely old woman to let her stay with her until her father came home. And so she waited. One day, she told the old woman that she was bored with nothing to do, and that she should buy her thread and she would spin. But the thread which Vasilisa spun was so thin and fine as silk hair that there was no machinery fine enough to weave it. So Vasilis asked the doll for advice. And in one night, the doll got a beautiful machine and, uh, went, and the cloth was finished. And Vasilis gave it to the old woman and told her to sell it and keep the money. The old woman took it to the royal castle where the king noticed it and asked how much she wanted for it. She said nobody could pay for that work and that she had brought it to him for a present. The king uh, thanked her, gave her presents and sent her away, but no tailor could be found to make the cloth and the shirts for it was too fine. So the king called the old woman and said that she, since she had spun and woven the cloth, she should be able to make shirts. She told him a young beautiful girl had made it. The king said the girl should make him the shirts. So Vasilis had made a dozen of the finest shirts and the old woman brought them to the king. Meanwhile, expectantly, Vasilisa washes herself and waits at the window. And presently, a servant uh, comes from the court and says that his majesty wanted to see this artist who had made the shirts of, of cloth so fine so that he could reward her with his own hands. And Vasilisa followed the servant to the palace and appeared before the king. And when he saw this beautiful girl, Vasilisa, he fell in love with her and said he would never be separated from her. She should be his wife. He took uh, her hands and put her on the throne and they were married that same day. So soon when Vasilisa's father came back from his travels, uh, he uh, rejoiced over her good fortune and from then on stayed with his daughter. And Vesalus also brought the old woman to the palace and the doll she kept with her until the end of her life. Okay, now, again, you know, this is like a dream. Uh, you know, it's got unbelievably deep, resonant meaning. And uh, it's going to take a while to go through all these images because it's, I don't really know how you skip any of them. But anyway, just to start out with... Uh, the setting is unusual because it's a merchant, a wife, and a daughter. Okay, now um, the uh, um, the ruling uh, persons in a fairy tale uh, rep uh, usually represent the dominance of collective consciousness, uh, and usually uh, the heroine or hero are a prince or princess, someone very high above average, or a poor peasant someone very below average, but here it's average people. So the father is a symbol of the uh, sum total of the average of the collective uh, spirit side. Uh, even though he plays an in insignificant role, neither good nor bad, and he only appears at the beginning of the and the end when there were no problems. So this whole drama takes place in the feminine realm. And, and remember, Two, it takes place in us. This, this is a fairy tale, is a fairy tale, uh, a wonderful x-ray of the um, 
of the uh, mysterious process of, uh, of discovering that uh, there's a conscious sun, but there is also a sun in the depths and it's the black sun and it's conscious too. So how do we have the relationship with a black sun, you know, uh, and uh, the one that's uh, in this consciousness in the darkness or in the depths? So um, that's what this is about, but it is on the feminine side. So um, when the merchant's wife dies suddenly and she has no name, no title, she represents the feminine type, this habitual type uh, of, uh, of, of the feminine, uh, which is repeated over and over again in humankind. So it's the sum of all women who live average life uh, in its various forms. But suddenly this average life of the mother collapses and cannot function anymore. And so she dies, the symbol of this mother dies in a way. And she's replaced by something magical, okay? Her blessing is magical, her dying blessing, and then this helpful doll. And uh, this is gonna be very interesting. So now other fairy tales, when the mother dies, she's often buried and on her grave grows a tree on which there's a bird and, or, or from which a voice comes that helps the girl. And the general motif is that after death, the positive mother figure, which some, uh, at the positive, after the death of the positive mother figure, the symbol of the positive mother figure, something supernatural and numinous survives. Um, and so this ghost of the mother symbol, which is no longer in conscious life, enters either an object or an animal. And it, uh, this is always in primitive societies, ancestral ghosts often appear uh, in objects or animals. And uh, uh, they thus carry on with the helpful functions that this person had, the helpful or, or damaging functions, which this person had when they were alive, but at another level. So what does it mean for uh, a, 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 a human a symbol to be replaced by an object or an animal. So uh, this archetypal contents of the mother symbol, when it appears in non-human shapes, it means that the, um, the archetype of the mother symbol has regressed from consciousness. Uh, a human personification of an archetype uh, shows it can be integrated on the human level. So ego has somewhat clear feeling or at least some vague idea as to what a personification of an archetype, which is a human personification means. But the animus appear the animus appearing as a human means it can at least be dealt with in some way. But if the animus is not a human, but it's a ghost voice coming from the grave, which is also can be a personification of the animus. No one can deal with that. Uh, the, uh, the, it's too removed, too autonomous, has not yet entered the field of consciousness. Now, so what we're, we're talking about is the death of the mother symbol. What does it mean? I mean, she spends a lot of time on this. The death of the mother symbol or the death of any archetype is always a transformation in uh, its uh, um, uh, what level it's operating at. The archetypes in themselves can't die. It's an inherited and instinctive uh, uh, energy, but it can change forms uh, from one to another, uh, from one symbolic aspect to another. And if that form is not human, uh, it can't easily be integrated into human life. So now we're gonna talk about the doll. And this, this is so interesting because it's gonna tell us a lot about uh, any numinous object, any object which 
possesses a divine aspect. Now this doll uh, possesses the, uh, uh, the symbol of the mother archetype. Uh, and, but what does uh, a cross represent? What does you know, other things represent? They are also, there are things that we have active imaginations with, whether we know it or not. Yeah. Uh, that it, it is a, uh, it, it is a, um, it, it is the other, you know, but it's in the outer form, not in an inner dialogue, but we're having a dialogue with something that possesses the divine within it. So now we're going to talk about the doll. The positive mother archetype dies, but remains with her as the doll. The doll is the deepest essence of the mother figure, but it is not her human side. The daughters uh, tend to have an archaic identity with the mother. If they have a positive relationship with her, with a doll, uh, girls can speak uh, uh, and have dialogues with it as in active imagination. Uh, and, uh, and they uh, often uh, will speak uh, the doll in the, in the daughter's play will often speak with the mother's own voice and with her own words. So she's having a, a dialogue, not with the real mother, but with the mother symbol in the form of this doll, which is divine. And um, it, uh, uh, women with the positive mother complex um, performs all her feminine tasks as her mother did and uh, educates her children the same way. This creates a continuity of form of life, but it has the disadvantage of preventing her, the daughter, uh, uh, through um, uh, becoming an individual. She, she cannot uh, 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 realize her own seed, her own essence and her own root if she just becomes this collective feminine symbol. So uh, if the mother dies, that means symbolically um, the realization that you can no longer be identical with her. So if the mother symbol dies, it, it, it means the realization that you can no longer be identical with her. So if you can't be identical with her, this is a turning point. This is uh, a point where uh, it's, a, it's somewhat of a crisis. Uh, um, you know, in, in Nietzsche, you know, when he says God is dead, okay. Okay, that didn't, God is the God that he thought of, uh, that was his, the one he, uh, he knew to be dead was dead. But that meant, that didn't mean God or the, that, um, that invisible reality that exists behind time and space was not dead. The one that brought life into the world, that was not dead. But this, uh, it, it had, there was a need for its evolution. You know, right at the point of, uh, of, of, uh, of the, um, of, the uh, um, of, of the Piscean age beginning, you know, uh, Very good. This, Annette has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Annette. Know. I'm sorry. Yes, please. Uh, in, interrupt anytime. Well, I thought she did. I saw him. Okay. And All also, right. I don't know, Azin was trying to get in. Do you see her on your screen anywhere or not? Oh, yes. Yes. I am so sorry. Jesus. Damn it. Sorry, I didn't have any questions. It must be somebody else, uh, Gary. Okay. Oh, okay. That's, that's, uh, I am so sorry. I, I, I hope Azin and, uh, and Ava haven't been waiting long. Darn it. I've I'm been sorry. waiting for 20 minutes. <laughs> I am so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, boy. Well, yeah. anyway, we're, we were talking about the doll. I'm so sorry, Azin. It's okay. I know the yeah. story. I oh, think okay. I the right time. <laughs> All right. Sure. No okay. Well, anyway. Um, we, we just read this story, but let me kind of uh, summarize what we're going to talk about since we only got 10 minutes left. I mean, we're going to talk about the doll and the fact that the doll uh, is, is represents uh, this mother symbol, which has, has died. And if the mother symbol dies, um, it means symbolically the re realization she can no longer uh, be identical with her. 
Um, yeah, if anybody sees somebody trying to get in, please tell me. I'm scatterbrained, darn it. Ooh, Ava, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if, if the mother dies, it means symbolically the realization she can no longer be identical with her. So what does it mean when something dies? It means that uh, you're, the daughter is confronted with a new task of finding her own femininity in its own form. And the task asks her to go through the difficulties of finding it. And in the, uh, uh, our, we have the archaic mother-daughter uh, identity here. It's broken off. And Vasilis is confronted now with uh, her own weakness. Since she no longer is identical with the mother, she's, she's confronted with her own ego weakness. So the great problem in feminine psychology is for uh, women more than men um, to uh, not identify with either the feminine image or with the mother archetype. And uh, she does it... Uh, it, it, she has this wonderful, I'm going to, we'll cover some of this later, but let me just summarize some of what's left here. She says, uh, one of the ways that you do this is through uh, the, this resistance, this unconscious resistance to being a member of the plot often uh, presents itself in maligning others in what she calls bitchiness, you know, because uh, uh, through uh, uh, this uh, gossiping and, and behind people's back. It's a trick of the unconscious aimed at separating us uh, from the herd. I mean, trying to get uh, the seed to develop and to uh, withdraw the projection of, being, of our identity, of our participation, mystique with the flow of bodies, with the herd, the flock, you know? And uh, so this doll, is uh, which is usually uh, a projection, uh, we think, of the child's fantasy of having children is a much deeper aspect. It is a, an object which contains the divinity. And many children can't sleep without a blankie or a teddy bear. And it's a, it's a, a fetish, which uh, we all have. That's why we have churches, you know which has to be in a certain place. Otherwise we can't sleep, sleep and we're exposed to the dangers of the night. And, but this is not the child's child's yet. It is the child's God. And such fetishes in children and, uh, and uh, uh, in such fetishes, the children realizes the symbol of the self, which usually happens, she says, when we're eight years old, you know, we, we realize that there's uh, some divine aspect in us, you know, and, and, and this really, I mean, I mean we're going to, we'll talk about this more at length, maybe in the discussion, but um, this, this really is what happens in all uh, uh, um, objects, which are numinous. They are really something in, in the outer world, which you're supposed to have a dialogue with, you know, um, uh, Young uh, had this famous saying, and this is, an ancient uh, uh, realization, you know, that, um, let's see, I got to grab it just a second here. I got to get it here. Here we go. If you can look at a picture of the god long enough, who nods. I mean, this is something Jung said. Now, now the idea is that uh, uh, the essence behind the numinous, the, the, um, what, what Angeli called uh, that we don't want to uh, lose the content of the projection. This, is, this content is the living self within us. Now you can project it on a doll, you can project it on a, any image, but it is, uh, in that image, uh, you can have a dialogue with it. But that's what, uh, what it really, so, so the instrument of Vasilis's uh, 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 individuation, okay, which means how she becomes undivided, okay? 
why is she divided? Why is she broken? Because, um, because human beings, the vessel of the pleroma, you know, this, this, uh, this depth uh, uh, within us uh, that created all life, you know, uh, wants a vessel. And somehow we are its vessel. And so why are we only half? Because we're, we are to be a vessel for the depths. And we are to be, at some point after we achieved uh, our animal life, our biological existence, we then need to realize that we're only half and that our other half uh, is, um, is, lives in, or is alive and is living in an invisible reality, you know, that we need to have a dialogue with. And it actually isn't an invisible reality. It's in your body. It's in your DNA. You know, it really is. Um, it is, uh, now, uh, uh, did, did GM- DC uh, did have his- Yes, his go, go ahead. Up. Well, um, you, you, you know, go ahead. Uh, G, GC, did you wanna ask a question? Or GM, did you wanna ask a question? Go ahead. Well, well, um, we'll, we'll, Hi. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, we 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 work with dreams, right? And we were processing the mother today. My name is Gilda, and yeah, uh, we were appointed to show up today for some reason. And uh, when we, uh, the story is so clever, um, and in so many ways, you have arrived at the. Um, we process the, the mother since the mother is so big and, and, and archetypes. And we came up with the, as long as the projection is thrown out there before it is nurtured or cultivated inwardly, then uh, problems uh, will continue to exist. But when, when um, and so the mother brings form and if the mother never processed the her life force as being uh, uh, acknowledging it inside of her and always went out there in order to find nourishing for the child or herself or what have you and never acknowledged her own self nourishing then it, the child can never uh, will continue to uh, look for it out there and so but uh, and, and that is so crucial. Um, so if the mother has found in her the light inside herself that is self-generated, then uh, she's able to pass that on to the child and the child uh, has that center. And whether it's a doll outside or anything, it's, it's totally irrelevant because it's always being self-generated. And since I work with dreams, um, the, uh, I believe that the Western modern way of using language uh, at this time has replaced the uh, uh, earlier way of projecting uh, the, the, uh, uh, a space to, to be able to mirror inner light. In, in objects or, or dolls or, or, or anything else, which were identical with forms outside of us. But language is being more abstract. Um, I write my dreams every day and unless I wrote the dreams down, the mirroring would be lost because the, the way uh, that we process information, thoughts, memory and everything is very ephemeral. So um, I just want to throw that out there. The, 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 the dreams, uh, you, you know, that we have don't use the regular uh, memory cells. You know, the memory, uh, the, those aspects in us where we remember events that happened to us in the outer world. But when the dream comes into our awareness, I don't think it uses the same uh, aspect of remembering. So, uh, you, you know, Charles, I don't know if Charles is still here, I think he had to leave, but one thing he does is he recites it. 
you know, the only thing I can do is to read it in to, uh, 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 you know, uh, like an iPad or something like that. Uh, you know, what Microsoft Word, if you have that, has a, a very accurate uh, speech to text thing in it. Don't use the one on the keyboard. Use the one in, in Microsoft Word. It's very accurate. Makes wonderful corrections, you know. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, well, when you say it's not the same or et cetera, um, what we understand that to be is that it's out of space and time. Yes. So, and it does use everything that we have of it. No, we're alive, everything that's there, and it will use whatever it is. Uh, Freud, in, in one of his uh, interpretation of dream books, mentions that a lot of the dreams within the, the um, last 24 hours of whatever you did, uh, or dreams will use uh, uh, objects and, and, and relational things that happened within the past 24 hours. And the mother from Sheryl Rovinda will say that some dreams are uh, uh, somewhat processing superficial information, whereas the more evolved one is using depth psychology, the dreams will uh, dive into depth with, uh, where source is where source meets awareness, where form is, is available. Otherwise, um, that's the point where there is an availability to be known. Beyond that, it cannot be known where there is you know, speaking, talking, seeing, or, or sensing, or anything other than that is out of the uh, awareness. So, um, uh, yeah. So, it, yeah, we're all dancing around the same. The, the, but once the light is self-generated, which is what all these fairy tales are dancing around, um, then uh, it, it's, it, it, you have found the life force and and therefore the mother dies because you already have the being is self-generated doesn't need to be um uh to 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 be linked to be to to have light to grow the light is self-generated and it can grow henceforth into the next step one one thing we'll find out uh in this wonderful fairy tale uh, 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 we're going to make a, um, some amazing journeys to some amazing places. Uh, one of them is is that uh, that uh, let me just mention a couple. Uh, the three. Th well, I mentioned the, the the seed aspect. That the seed aspect, uh, sorting the seeds, is uh, is 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 the feminine method of achieving clarity. Uh, this is this, and that is that. You know. And it, it absolutely needs to happen for clarity. And she'll give examples of, of how if you don't do it, um, that muddling aspect allows the shadow to come in and cause mischief. Uh, only with that clarity. Where the masculine logos will do it uh, from, from uh, a bird's eye view, the, uh, the, the feminine consciousness has to do it uh, through um, this is this and that is that. That's one thing. And I'll just mention a couple others and then we'll open it up for, for, for. The other one is the mortar and pestle. Now, the, the mortar and pestle uh, uh, is uh, the object of grinding something and pulverizing it into its basic material, okay? That's what Baba Yaga rides around in. Now, the, the name uh, Vasilisa, uh, the the uh, uh, Baba Yaga is is a re, is a remnant of the image of Hecate, who was the goddess of the underworld, and uh, she is uh, in in the uh, late Hellenistic age. She became uh, identical with uh, this Neoplatonic world soul, so she represented both all of life and all of uh, death. And she was called, uh, she was actually a, a savior of the world. She was called Satera, Hecate Satera. And she also uh, was uh, the goddess of boundaries because like Hermes, she could go to any one of the three worlds. Now her daughter is Persephone, 
okay? And one of the titles of, of Persephone, if you've ever read uh, um, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, this will be familiar, was um, that she was the queen of the underworld, Persephone, and her name in Greek was Basilisus, okay? Now, if you remember in, um, when in Young's near-death experience, um, he was about to enter the stone where all questions would be answered. And right as he's about to go into it, suddenly his doctor comes in the form, Young said, of a basileus, a coast. Now that's the masculine version of basilissa. Now a basileus, a coast, coast is the island where um, Asclepius lives, the god of healing. And this is his doctor. And he comes in the form of a king of the, of the island of, of Asclepius. And he tells him that you can't leave yet. There's too many, there will be, there's too much lament on the world uh, for you to leave. And some of his followers all said, well, who was this person that was lamenting so much? <laughs> you know? But anyway, so her name, Bas, Bas, Basilissa, is Basilissa. So this is the tale of Hecate and Persephone, okay? Now, he, she's also, she's this goddess of, mortal, of, of the pestle and the mortar. And uh, the word for grinding uh, is, is in uh, Latin is taro, and it means contrition, you know, which is the highest form of remorse. And the only way that you can achieve this type of remorse is to, um, to be ground up into powder, to have the negative aspects of ego annihilated. Now, this is the aspect in her too, uh, that she is the goddess of complete annihilation, destruction, and um, chaos, okay? Because before you can uh, achieve contrition, which is the process of grinding up the negative aspect, you know, people say, well, I'm not, you can't annihilate ego you, because you need consciousness. Well, yes, but the idea is to uh, annihilate the negative aspects of ego, the willfulness, so that it becomes an empty vessel. Now, that's the other aspect, you know. Now, I'll add all of this up to, you know, the images that we're supposed to. Uh, now, this, remember, this is a fairy tale about each one of us, okay? And it's giving me just these incredible uh, uh, clues about what's happening. You know, and, and, and they're so mysteriously stated. You know, it's just, uh, uh, it, we, we've got plenty to go through. I mean, it's gonna take three or four sessions to go through all of these wonderful images. Well, anyway, uh, Gary, do you wanna open it up uh, for just comments or anything, you know, whatever? I am so sorry, Azim. Uh, God, that's horrible. Yeah, I have a comment about annihilation of the ego. Um, in, in our experience and working with it sort of like inside the cave for like seven years, um, the annihilation is a, a, a it brings a, uh, a point of uh, awareness that ha carries the danger of bypassing and uh, it, it somehow it does not work. And we found that integration of the ego where it becomes, uh, it is integrated live, not annihilated, into the entire uh, luminous mix without uh, a specific uh, leading identity uh, works. Uh, it's not bypassed and it still exists available if it needs to be, if it needs, it, it's just, it becomes like a uh, part of the whole versus uh, using annihil annihilation in order to arrive at that communion space. And that, in, in my estimation, that uh, causes a lot of bypassing that, uh, is, is creates unnecessary pain or unnecessary uh, 
that eventually leaves uh, scars that that are not healed, and and that in itself takes you in some other place where that needs to take be healed and so on. And so it's a never ending kind of uh, play when one uses annihilation versus uh, complete integration. This is the message, the symbol in the fairy tale, and uh, you know we're the mortar and pestle. And uh, Marie-Louise von Franz will have more to say about this when we get into it in detail. But uh, it is the object of, of Jung uh, said uh, that uh, no one can, uh, you know, he, he found out in himself in his own uh, uh, experiences with death, uh, the depths, is that no one can be human unless they touch bottom. And this is what von Franz says too, but I'm, I'm not, I, we're just going through the fairy tales images and what von Franz says about them. You know, I don't really possess any metaphysical wisdom <laughs> outside that. You know, I'm trying oh. to learn from von Franz, you know, so uh, anyway. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, yeah, uh, let's yeah. go ahead and go around the group. Yeah. Uh, uh, Diane, do you have a comment? Well, Again, to say how profound this um, fairy tale is, and you know, I've read almost both uh, through chapter eleven, but not all of it. And also, just to share with you, when I was uh, my children were young, I wrote a personal myth similar to this, and I'll try. To, I need to go back and look at it, um, but. It was um, transformative for me about, you know, not having to do things the way the generations of my family did them, but also not having that recognized by the outside world after the transformation. So that's all I have to share at the moment. It's just, uh, it, like you said, it's in all of us. It's a transformation of all of us. Well, if you can get that, Diane, I'd love to hear it too, because what, one, the one thing I'm saying that in all of these fairy tales we've dealt with with Von Franz, she's talking about the living blood flowing human with their feet, uh, pressing into the earth, you know, I mean, that's, that's the feeling I get in each one of her, uh, the way she analyzes it. I mean, she's just uh, a, a very much a uh, earth mother, you know, and she gives us uh, what kind of what the earth mother uh, would say in, in a human way. I, I, I just wonder if any other, anybody else feels that. Well, it's sort of like the Qigong when we stand and we have our feet going into the earth and we do that in, you know, um, motion with the body and recognizing the divine within the, the body. So that's all I have to say now. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Elaine, would you like to go next? Yeah, I don't know how von Franz happened to be in my childhood, but she certainly described it perfectly well because I lost my mother when I was young. And I uh, don't remember having a lot of galls or anything, and I became a mother just fine, but it did make me incredibly independent. And I read a few of her comments uh, in the last few chapters about how... Uh, women need to uh, attain independence and that's what's so hard for them to do. And looking at the doll, you know, that's a real, of course, we're taught in um, human development that that's a transitional um, transitional ob object that the, the girl uh, uses, or even a, even a boy, you know, the teddy bear or whatever that they, you know, they have to be in love and sleep with this, um, transitional object that represents the mom and the and the comfort but the fact that von france just nails it by saying it is the doll that it is god it is the child's god i mean wow 
that's just so amazing that she would do that. So I don't know what else I have to say, except maybe my eight-year-old granddaughter is going through the sense of self thing right now and all the evil she got bullied at school. And I just, I read her into this, these last three chapters, just, I can't get her off my mind. Awesome. Just turned eight, by the way, just recently. Mm -hmm. did, wait, she just had a birthday, didn't she? Only yes, she did. Yeah. She did. Yeah. She just had a birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is, I mean, the whole idea is, is all of us, uh, you, you know, on what rock did our ship break up? you know, and then how do we pick up the pieces? I mean, that's pretty much why we're all here, you know. Yeah, true, true. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Kat? Hi, um, I really love that story and I just want to sort of go over it over and over again and yeah. take as much in as I can. I, I'm um, I've got lots of thoughts at the minute, but the thing that fascinates me is when um, about the 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 pestle and mortar, and it's oh my god, I don't know. It reminded me of a dream I had recently, and when you said Craig about the feminine way is to go through the, the details as such rather than have the sort of overview. I had a dream just recently where I was in like, I can only describe it as a, I, I feel it was like an, an old alchemist like room. And what like, this is gonna sound proper disgusting, so <laughs> please forgive me. I had chocolate, but it was like a splat. And in it was like, like pus or saying and I was trying to get to the root of it really pull it out stretch it out bite it out and everything else and this character said why are you doing this and it's like you don't understand I have to do it <laughs> I have to get to the bottom of this so that I learn and understand because I had I had thought am I uh, there was something I wanted to learn or whatever, but I thought, am I obsessing over it too much? Why can't I just let it go? And then I had that dream and it's like, that's why, because there was such, it was such a, a deep level of understanding, not just details. It was just a greater level of understanding that I was needing to have. Um, that but um yeah but this is really cool and i, I want to go through it all again <laughs> so thank you uh, you, mm. you know the one thing that on that image uh, that uh, going through the seeds and i i know uh, that impressed aline as well is my wife does this all the time she has to go over and over and over every event of her life to provide clarity you know and she works with troubled women and she has to do the same thing with them. She goes and she, they'll sit for three hours and they just try to uh, get clarity of what's happening and try to remove the muddle, you know, where the shadow resides. And, uh, you know, now I am absolutely not an expert at do, doing this. You know, you know, when I said I, I, every day's Christmas Eve for me, that's not necessarily a good thing. You, you know, what, what, what it means is, is, is I, um, I, I, there's an aspect of the shadow realm that I am totally unaware of, you know, so that's, that's uh, something that I've always suffered with, really, it, this aspect of, of the positive aspect, not sorting through my own emotions and pain. Oh, uh, Tim? Boy, as usual, I find this really fascinating material. Um, the one thing that really poked out at me when I was reading the tale was, um, I don't quite understand how the, the negative, the negative mother complex comes out in a woman's life. And maybe some of you can address that. I had a really great mother. And so my sister is a great example of, 
of what she's talking about, um, emulating the, the mother's life and then building on that in her own individuation. But I'm just kind of confused about the negative, the, the dark mother complex. And so looking forward to getting that illuminated. I'll just say I'm not, those who can't do teach, it normally uh, it's supposed to represent a, a stifled uh, development and, and, and not allowing the child to, uh, to become uh, adult. You know? Yeah, not allowing them to become their own selves, but trying uh, to make them like a copy. Perhaps I could comment something on this. Yeah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yes, because I in the Philippines there's quite a lot of uh, negative mother complex because it's quite matriar matriarchal. So it can come out as paranoia because uh, the because of its terrible mother devouring aspect. So everything becomes this devouring aspect of society, people, and so on. So it might come out as um, paranoia. Mm. Her description, yeah, Kevin. Yeah, what's what's really interesting, and, and this was this is from uh, Gerhard Adler's book, is the paranoia aspect has two aspects. One is if if the devouring mother keeps you in the womb too long, you know you have claustrophobia. Okay, claustrophobia, this feel of being closed in to a, a, a place. You you don't you you get a, a, a panic if you're in a too small of a space that's, that has no opening. Now, the other aspect is uh, if you leave the womb too early, you have agoraphobia, which is the fear of open spaces. <laughs> you know, now, now the both of these are aspects of the, of the negative mother complex. Did you leave the er womb too early or did, because she kicked you out or did she try to devour you and not never let you leave this virtual womb that she put uh, around her, her uh, uh, pre-pubescent uh, child, you know, who she, who she never wants to grow up. But anyway, that's, that's wonderful, Kevin. It's so nice to see you too. Dahlia? Oh, I had like so many, many ideas and I need to sort them out, but I was wondering uh, about the um, the saying. Uh, it was mentioned like if you ask too much or if you. Uh, what was the formulation? Because and I'm not sure if it, in English you still use it like every day, because it exists in Lithuanian and we say it like if you know too much, you'll get old very too quickly. Even for the kids, like a protection, like don't be too noisy or like don't ask too much. And uh, yeah, it's like uh, like setting boundaries a little bit too. So I was wondering that culturally if it's like still you in alive. So too much knowledge makes you old. She yeah, says, yeah, that's, you know, yeah. and uh, and and what she's not supposed to ask about, and she's going to go through this at length. And you know, people have read. The 11th and 12th lecture of of that um, uh, of how horrible nature is, how uh, you know death and decay and uh, thing. It's not a refutation of life. Okay, the the aspect of the horribleness of being of of life is not a refutation of the beauty and joy of life. You know, mm. there's always this upcoming and downgoing. We're all going to experience the downgoing, but we don't need to dwell on it. You know, uh, we we need to. Uh, she'll go through this in a much more eloquent way than 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 I do. But it's an interesting contrast to the fact that, and she's not supposed to ask about what goes on inside the house. She can ask about what goes outside, but not inside. You know, Mother Nature does. Uh, you, you 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 know the fact that she's. This mother nature is so neutral, you know, uh, that that she she has uh, predators and prey. She loves the prey with all her heart, but she loves the predators with all her heart too. So don't ask. Too much knowledge makes you old, you know. Now 
the, the idea, it contrasts this to Parsifal. What was his uh, sin? It was that he did not ask questions. But anyway. A sin? Yes, I was thinking that um, going through the seeds and separating them, I was thinking about myself talking to my friends on the phone. It's, it doesn't stop there. I think um, you separate them, you review the events, what was going on, who said what. And then th that's where the pistol and martyr comes um, in. And you rearrange them. You mix them in a new way that um, makes sense to you. Maybe looking through a different lens or, uh, I don't know, finding deeper aspects. But I think it's kind of interaction between these two aspects. Also, Dark Mother, I, I think um, the, the core of... Um, mother archetype is uh, life-giving. And um, Marie von Franz uh, has a uh, paragraph about it that uh, women who do not, who did not want to be mothers, um, they give their children this idea that it's wrong for them to be alive. And that creates a lot of suicidal thoughts. And I share that with uh, my students. Uh, some of us uh, had this experience. And for me, myself, it was just like, because I have suicidal thoughts uh, after prison um, since 19 years old. It's, um, it's a daily struggle for me. But um, um, I, when, I, when I realized that it's related to my mother, because she did not want to have children. She wanted to travel in the world. She wanted to be a writer. And uh, because of the templates, uh, and uh, my grandmother was a very authoritarian woman. So she had to succumb and marry and have children. And deep in her mind, she really didn't want us. So I realized that um, when I realized that it's my mother, it made me really angry and it uh, reduced, <laughs> reduced it to these other thoughts because now I know that who, what is happening, you know, I always related it to prison and stuff. But it is, that was very uh, interesting aspect. And I think um, it affects the core, um, the, your relationship with life, the way you're rooted to the life and you're related to the life is affected by um, mother um, archetype. So it really can be dangerous and in many as in many ways, many different ways. And also about um, mirroring. Uh, I was thinking um, about Gilgamesh myth, and um, I mentioned it before here that uh, one of the first things that happened when he creates the wall around the Uruk, which is the ego. He separates people who are inside from others, people who are outside, and they complain um, about Gilgamesh to God, that he's not behaving well and he's doing this and that. And by this othering, this process of othering, um, it, it is a process. At the, in the beginning, it can be um, you are creating an enemy. The other is the enemy. But as we grow in this uh, process or archetype, um, we start to see ourselves uh, in the other. So othering is a process of mirroring. When we are not able to mirror ourselves, they become our enemies. They become our dark shadows, right? But if we go through the process um, in a conscious way, we mirror. We see ourselves in others, and we see others in ourselves. And there's also a word, um, paradolia, paradolia. That is um, this phenomenon that um, human beings, when they look at an image, they see a human face. Like it might be in the moon. I remember 
Um, I've, Iran, when there was a revolution in Iran, everybody said, look at the moon, you can see Imam Khomeini in the moon. And people were really seeing him. So um, it's just this projection of human face and my being onto the world as the other. Uh, and this relationship with the doll is the same thing. Uh, she's seeing, um, she becomes the mother to the uh, doll. So this relationship between human being and the world or human and God, this mirroring is really interesting. And it's happening in projections, it's happening um, in, as, as we call it love. And it's really interesting. Uh, phenomenon. As we and we later project our projections, and we say God created human as His image, right? So now it is God who is mirroring, who is seeing Himself in us. You know, it's really interesting process. And if you look at the idols at Gilgamesh uh, time, I will share the image. They don't have eyes. It's just black holes. It's like they're gazing into a darkness. And then later, when um, later in the history of these idols, they start to have really big eyes. It's like the whole face is the eye. Well, fascinating as always, Hussein. <laughs> yeah, it's you very me? interesting if you look at uh, uh, early art, there were no faces, you know. Mm -hmm. It was only uh, until, uh, I think it is this uh, mask of Warka in Sumer, it was the first presentation of the human face, you know. It, 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 you know, if you look at the Venus of Losel or the Venus of Willendorf or, or you know, the uh, shaman of Les Trois Frères, I mean, these represented very few representatives of, of, of hominid figures in art. None can of them share, had a face. Can you share, can you share it? And uh, if you may mention the date, I want to see if they're before these idols or after these idols. Yeah, well, I think the, the, the Warka uh, face is about 5,000 or 7,000. It's either 5,000 BC or 5,000 yeah. years old. I'm not sure which, whichever Sumer is. Yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can find the image. I send the idols. So, Kevin, do you uh, have anything for us? It's been a long time. Yeah, sure. Uh, just a quick, uh, we don't have time for, <laughs> but I can share a dream, uh, a very quick dream. No worries. It's very quick. Uh, yeah, I just saw the same images, actually, this many years back. So I was in the forest and in the hut, and I saw this, um, I don't know if she was a witch or something. I talked to her, then... I had to go through some gate. I had to turn into snake to go to get into this gate. But the image which struck me was there is a house with a glass window. And all I knew that I had to break this glass window. And when I broke it, it was like full of skeleton falling down. And for me, it just reminds me of the images um, Craig uh, talked about. So that was, uh, and I, I am male, you know, I, I like to think I have a male psyche. I don't know. <laughs> I found a lot in this that, uh, re 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 but every one of those images, the skeleton, the being in the forest, the being in the, yeah, we're going to have to hear more about that. If you can send me a, a cop text of it, Kevin, I'd love to look at it. Great. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Eva? Do you have a, anything for us, Eva? I don't know if Eva's there or not. How about Ernia? I, Yes, Irina. Irina, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually, I think there's a, a too much information for me today, so I, I don't have anything to say. Maybe next week I need to digest everything. I just want to make a quick comment that um, mothers who don't love their children, especially their daughters, is a very common theme actually um, in our world today. And um, uh, only like in the past 10 or 15 years, people started talking about it. Mm -hmm. There are some books on the subject. So um, it's, a, um, I think it's a very important topic or theme for many women. So um, for those who don't understand what it is. 
my my father uh, my father's brother told him uh, that his mother he was born when she was 40 and her sister was born 42 she says uh, she got done raising kids 15 years ago she he said i raised you <laughs> did you all have anything more gc Hello, everyone. Um, um, I, I find these stories almost like when one reads a, um, a mystical book that has been around for ages that you can just take any sentence and spin off. Where, where are we now in respect to the psyche that was when those stories were written? And there, uh, there seems to be something uh, that has evolved, even though the the structures are still of, of these tales and what they portray are still around. That um, perhaps is not written yet because it's in the process of evolution, and usually by the time it gets put down for everyone. It has already uh, taken place by a very few. And so that that's where I'm at. And um, so we're enjoying very much and we can and we feel whether it's true or not is, is up to whoever knows that we can penetrate and um, find the similarities that have been around forever and and why is that so and where is it now? So we always like to see where is it now? in the present time and uh because otherwise my my reality as a being is continuing to reflect past something that has that is in the past and the contribution available as something in the present is covered up and uh can't 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 unfold from so so much past overlay can't 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 come forth and so that that's what i have to add thank you hope that's helpful well i think that's uh everyone craig oh, awesome. okay well great i just I, I just uh mentioned that we're uh um you, you know just based on what you said uh, gilda i think is your name right uh yeah is uh, uh where yes. are you from gilda uh can you just tell us approximately it doesn't have to be specific from the universe oh you're from the universe okay great <laughs> well i'm from deepest darkest iowa but uh i'm not hoping i'm not a life for her but you you know one thing young said about the uh first of all the images where did the images come from you know according to young i don't you know is that it is from uh the uh place where life came from Know, from that uh, that source that created this improbable state of order, which is called consciousness. And yes. he says it's always around, he, he said it was always about 300 years behind current events. Okay. Uh, so uh, it, 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 it was, had a conservatism that uh, was, um, and, and, and yet, um, you know, uh, Jungian psychology itself was, uh, he, he says, is not a discovery, it's a rediscovery. You know, he was rediscovering uh, what, what, what um, uh, Peter Kingsley says, that all of civilization and all of culture came from people lying down in dark spaces and doing active imagination with a living consciousness within them, you know, because this thin veneer of ego is, is, uh, is, abs is, is, it's just sort of, uh, it can only hold one or two things in it at the same time, you know, it, and it just goes rat a tat tat and everything is, is, is sort of linear in it, you know, uh, the the uh, what we can hold in our awareness anyway, but but what speaks to us in dreams is not 
is 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 bottomless. You know, there is no no bottom to it. And and like you say, these fairy tales. Uh, now, does anyone else have any more comments before we leave? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had one comment about this. So yeah. I thought it was you, Craig, who said, or somebody said that the fairy tale is something that's happening now. And that's why these fairy tales are myths are so important because they are relevant to us today. They are happening yeah. now. So um, I think these are the patterns that are uh, repeating themselves. We just need to figure out um, exactly what they are. Well, well yeah, they're, they are... Uh... They are speaking to our own uh, development. You know, what Marie-Louise von Franz says, there's the, the, the truest thing we have, the most honest thing we have, an X-ray of the psyche. Azine, uh, what did you have to say? I just, uh, yes. add, I just wanna say that ego, that's why ego is so important in depth psychology and it's considered to be a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, not egotism, but ego. So mm -hmm. ego acts um, like a reflective surface. So the whole mirroring thing between us inside and the world would not happen if there was not this reflective surface in between. So we want it thin, we want it flexible, but we want it there, you know? And she's gonna discuss what uh, ego, uh, what, what she's talking about ego. She's got a nuance on it, I, I'm not, disagreeing with what Gilda said at all earlier, but uh, what, what she's, she's, she is going to let, let her describe what she means by annihilation uh, through the mortar and the pestle, you know? And, and Arena, by the way, every one of these and every one of our dreams and everything applies to uh, what, what Marie-Louise von Franz called the Tao of this moment. You know, every dream, is expressing uh, the Tao of this current present moment, you know, and uh, um, the, the fairy tales uh, describe sort of eternal aspect. Now, what she means by eternal is something that is uh, exists outside of time and space of the archetypes, you know, they're archetypes in some kind of a drama aspect. So they're kind of telling us what the what um, James Hillman calls, uh, you, you know, the pandemonium of the images. <laughs> it's just is unbelievable cluster thinking. You know, Edward Edinger sometimes would try to draw a picture of it, and it's just got like three hundred things in it. You know, but anyway, uh, any other comments before we leave? Uh, and we'll just keep going on it. We, you know, we spent a lot of time today on uh, on just reading the fairy tale. Um, and by I the way, say that. Okay. Yeah, go ahead that um, it's almost like we sense that we're all dancing around trying to um, give a definition or a form or, or, or something to engage with. Um, something that for, for me is mystery, but we continue to elaborate and hope to evolve by naming, defining and and, and bringing parallel realities into it. But um, at the end of it is, is, is mystery. Yeah, the two things, medium of expression and, and meaning. The medium of expression is the mystery and the aspect of meaning is, uh, is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's not quite like guessing the name of Rumpelstiltskin, but... <laughs> It's somewhat similar, you know. But anyway, uh, we'll we'll the, we'll keep the point where where something can be known or not known, in, or or aware one can be awake aware to it. If one is not awake aware to it in any, it, it doesn't exist. Then there is no uh, association of any kind. Yeah. So that is the the tipping point of source and the next step. Yeah, and we'll be talking about the turning point too. And one thing, Gary, I would like to set up some more admins in here. So if I don't, uh, if I screw up that we can have somebody let somebody in. I feel stop just horrible. Stop, yeah. stop feeling guilty, just stop. Yeah, well, it made me feel, <laughs> I felt horrible. 
Anyway, well, thank you and welcome, uh, Kevin. We're glad to see you and Gilda and Irina and Gary and Diane and Dahlia and Aline and uh, Azine and Kat and Tim and everybody. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. See you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And Dahlia.